Daniel Webster, who looked like a god and talked like Jehovah, was one of the most successful advocates who ever pleaded a case, yet he ushered in his most powerful arguments with such friendly remarks as, it will be for the jury to consider this may perhaps be worth thinking of here are some facts that I trust you will not lose sight of or you, with your knowledge of human nature, will easily see the significance of these facts, no bulldozing, no high-pressure methods, no attempt to force his opinions on others. Webster used the soft-spoken, quiet, friendly approach, and it helped to make him famous. You may never be called upon to settle a strike or address a jury, but you may want to get your rent reduced. Will the friendly approach help you then? Let's see. Oh, L. Straub, an engineer, wanted to get his rent reduced, and he knew his landlord was hard-boiled. I wrote him Mr. Straub said in a speech before the class, notifying him that I was vacating my apartment as soon as my lease expired. The truth was, I didn't want to move. I wanted to stay if I could get my rent reduced. But the situation seemed hopeless. Other tenants had tried and failed. Everyone told me that the landlord was extremely difficult to deal with. But I said to myself, I am studying a course in how to deal with people, so I'll try it on him and see how it works. He and his secretary came to see me as soon as he got my letter. I met him at the door with a friendly greeting. I fairly bubbled with goodwill and enthusiasm. I didn't begin talking about how high the rent was. I began talking about how much I liked his apartment house. Believe me, I was hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. I complimented him on the way he ran the building and told him I should like so much to stay for another year, but I couldn't afford it. He had evidently never had such a reception from a tenant. He hardly knew what to make of it. Then he started to tell me his troubles. Complaining tenants. One had written him 14 letters, some of them positively insulting. Another threatened to break his lease unless the landlord kept the man on the floor above from snoring. What a relief it is he said to have a satisfied tenant like you. And then, without my even asking him to do it, he offered to reduce my rent a little. I wanted more, so I named the figure I could afford to pay, and he accepted without a word. As he was leaving, he turned to me and asked, what decorating can I do for you? If I had tried to get the rent reduced by the methods the other tenants were using, I am positive I should have met with the same failure they encountered. It was the friendly, sympathetic, appreciative approach that won. Dean Woodcock of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is the superintendent of a department of the local electric company. His staff was called upon to repair some equipment on top of a pole. This type of work had formerly been performed by a different department and had only recently been transferred to Woodcock's section. Although his people had been trained in the work, this was the first time they had ever actually been called upon to do it. Everybody in the organization was interested in seeing if and how they could handle it. Mr. Woodcock, several of his subordinate managers, and members of other departments of the utility, went to see the operation. Many cars and trucks were there, and a number of people were standing around watching the two lone men on top of the pole. Glancing around, Woodcock noticed a man up the street getting out of his car with a camera. He began taking pictures of the scene. Utility people are extremely conscious of public relations, and suddenly Woodcock realized what this setup looked like to the man with the camera overkill. Dozens of people being called out to do a two-person job. He strolled up the street to the photographer. I see you're interested in our operation. Yes, and my mother will be more than interested. She owns stock in your company. This will be an eye-opener for her. She may even decide her investment was unwise. I've been telling her for years there's a lot of waste motion in companies like yours. This proves it. The newspapers might like these pictures, too. It does look like it, doesn't it? I'd think the same thing in your position, but this is a unique situation, and Dean Woodcock went on to explain how this was the first job of this type for his department, and how everybody from executives down was interested. He assured the man that under normal conditions two people could handle the job. The photographer put away his camera, shook Woodcock's hand, and thanked him for taking the time to explain the situation to him. Dean Woodcock's friendly approach saved his company much embarrassment and bad publicity.
Another member of one of our classes, Gerald H. Wynn of Littleton, New Hampshire, reported how by using a friendly approach he obtained a very satisfactory settlement on a damage claim. Early in the spring he reported, before the ground had thawed from the winter freezing, there was an unusually heavy rainstorm, and the water, which normally would have run off to nearby ditches and storm drains along the road, took a new course onto a building lot, where I had just built a new home. Not being able to run off, the water pressure built up around the foundation of the house. The water forced itself under the concrete basement floor, causing it to explode, and the basement filled with water. This ruined the furnace and the hot water heater. The cost to repair this damage was in excess of $2,000. I had no insurance to cover this type of damage. However, I soon found out that the owner of the subdivision had neglected to put in a storm drain near the house which could have prevented this problem. I made an appointment to see him. During the 25-mile trip to his office, I carefully reviewed the situation, and, remembering the principles I learned in this course, I decided that showing my anger would not serve any worthwhile purpose. When I arrived, I kept very calm and started by talking about his recent vacation to the West Indies, then, when I felt the timing was right, I mentioned the little problem of water damage. He quickly agreed to do his share in helping to correct the problem. A few days later he called and said he would pay for the damage and also put in a storm drain to prevent the same thing from happening in the future. Even though it was the fault of the owner of the subdivision, if I had not begun in a friendly way, there would have been a great deal of difficulty in getting him to agree to the total liability. Years ago, when I was a barefoot boy walking through the woods to a country school out in northwest Missouri, I read a fable about the sun and the wind. They quarreled about which was the stronger, and the wind said, I'll prove I am. See the old man down there with a coat. I bet I can get his coat off him quicker than you can. So the sun went behind a cloud, and the wind blew until it was almost a tornado. But the harder it blew, the tighter the old man clutched his coat to him. Finally, the wind calmed down and gave up, and then the sun came out from behind the clouds and smiled kindly on the old man. Presently, he mopped his brow and pulled off his coat. The sun then told the wind that gentleness and friendliness were always stronger than fury and force. The use of gentleness and friendliness is demonstrated day after day by people who have learned that a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. F. Gail Connor of Lutherville, Maryland, proved this when he had to take his four-month-old car to the service department of the car dealer for the third time. He told our class, it was apparent that talking to, reasoning with or shouting at the service manager, was not going to lead to a satisfactory resolution of my problems. He smiled with satisfaction as he listened to me. I then explained the problem I was having with the service department. I thought you might want to be aware of any situation that might tarnish your fine reputation I added. He thanked me for calling this to his attention and assured me that my problem would be taken care of. Not only did he personal get involved, but he also lent me his car to use while mine was being repaired. Aesop was a Greek slave who lived at the court of Croesus and spun immortal fables 600 years before Christ. Yet the truths he taught about human nature are just as true in Boston and Birmingham now as they were 26 centuries ago in Athens. The sun can make you take off your coat more quickly than the wind, and kindliness, the friendly approach and appreciation, can make people change their minds more readily than all the bluster and storming in the world. Remember what Lincoln said, a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. Principle 4. Begin in a friendly way. 14. In talking with people, don't begin by discussing the things on which you differ. Begin by emphasizing and keep on emphasizing the things on which you agree. Keep emphasizing, if possible, that you are both striving for the same end, and that your only difference is one of method, and not of purpose. Get the other person saying yes. Yes at the outset. Keep your opponent, if possible, from saying no. And no response, according to Professor Overstreet, is a most difficult handicap to overcome. When you have said no all your pride of personality demands that you remain consistent with yourself. You may later feel that the no was ill-advised, nevertheless, there is your precious pride to consider. Once having said a thing, you feel you must stick to it. Hence it is of the very greatest importance that a person be started in the affirmative direction. 
Harry A. Overstreet, Influencing Human Behavior, New York, Norton, 1925, the skillful speaker gets, at the outset, a number of yes responses, this sets the psychological process of the listeners moving in the affirmative direction, it is like the movement of a billiard ball, propel in one direction, and it takes some force to deflect it, far more force to send it back in the opposite direction, the psychological patterns here are quite clear, when a person says no and really means it, he or she is doing far more than saying a word of two letters, the entire organism glandular, nervous, muscular gathers itself together into a condition of rejection, there is usually in minute but sometimes an observable degree, a physical withdrawal or readiness for withdrawal, the whole neuromuscular system, in short, sets itself on guard against acceptance, when, to the contrary, a person says yes none of the withdrawal activities takes place, the organism is in a forward moving, accepting, open attitude, hence the more yeses we can, at the very outset, induce, the more likely we are to succeed in capturing the attention for our ultimate proposal, it is a very simple technique this yes response, and yet, how much it is neglected, it often seems as if people get a sense of their own importance by antagonizing others at the outset, get a student to say no at the beginning, or a customer, child, husband, or wife, and it takes the wisdom and the patience of angels, to transform that bristling negative into an affirmative, the use of this yes, yes technique enabled James Eberson, who was a teller in the Greenwich Savings Bank, in New York City, to secure a prospective customer who might otherwise have been lost. This man came in to open an account said Mr. Eberson, and I gave him our usual form to fill out, some of the questions he answered willingly, but there were others he flatly refused to answer, before I began the study of human relations, I would have told this prospective depositor, that if he refused to give the bank this information, we should have to refuse to accept this account, I am ashamed that I have been guilty of doing that very thing in the past, naturally, an ultimatum like that made me feel good, I had shown who was boss, that the bank's rules and regulations couldn't be flouted, but that sort of attitude certainly didn't give a feeling of welcome and importance to the man who had walked in to give us his patronage, I resolved this morning to use a little horse sense, I resolved not to talk about what the bank wanted, but about what the customer wanted, and above all else, I was determined to get him saying yes, yes from the very start, so I agreed with him, I told him the information he refused to give was not absolutely necessary, yes, of course he replied, don't you think I continued, that it would be a good idea to give us the name of your next of kin, so that, in the event of your death, we could carry out your wishes without error or delay, again, he said, yes, the young man's attitude softened and changed when he realized that we weren't asking for this information for our sake, but for his sake, before leaving the bank, this young man not only gave me complete information about himself, but he opened, at my suggestion, a trust account, naming his mother as the beneficiary for his account, and he had gladly answered all the questions concerning his mother also, I found that by getting him to say yes, yes from the outset, he forgot the issue at stake, and was happy to do all the things I suggested, Joseph Allison, a sales representative for Westinghouse Electric Company, had this story to tell, there was a man in my territory that our company was most eager to sell to, my predecessor had called on him for 10 years without selling anything, when I took over the territory, I called steadily for 3 years without getting an order, finally, after 13 years of calls and sales talk, we sold him a few motors, if these proved to be alright, an order for several hundred more would follow, such was my expectation, right, I knew they would be alright, so when I called three weeks later, I was in high spirits, the chief engineer greeted me with this shocking announcement, Allison, I can't buy the remainder of the motors from you, why, I asked in amazement, why, because your motors are too hot, I can't put my hand on them, I knew it wouldn't do any good to argue, I had tried that sort of thing too long, so I thought of getting the yes, yes response, well, now look, Mr. Smith I said, I agree with you a hundred percent, 
If those motors are running too hot, you ought not to buy any more of them. You must have motors that won't run any hotter than standards set by the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. Isn't that so? He agreed it was. I had gotten my first yes. The Electrical Manufacturers Association regulations say that a properly designed motor may have a temperature of 72 degrees Fahrenheit above room temperature. Is that correct? Yes, he agreed. That's quite correct. But your motors are much hotter. I didn't argue with him. I merely asked, how hot is the mill room? Oh, he said, about 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, I replied, if the mill room is 75 degrees, and you add 72 to that, that makes a total of 147 degrees Fahrenheit. Wouldn't you scald your hand if you held it under a spigot of hot water at a temperature of 147 degrees Fahrenheit? Again he had to say yes. Well I suggested, wouldn't it be a good idea to keep your hands off those motors? Well, I guess you're right he admitted. We continued to chat for a while. Then he called his secretary and lined up approximately $35,000 worth of business for the ensuing month. It took me years and cost me countless thousands of dollars and lost business before I finally learned that it doesn't pay to argue that it is much more profitable and much more interesting to look at things from the other person's viewpoint and try to get that person saying yes, yes. Eddie Snow, who sponsors our courses in Oakland, California, tells how he became a good customer of a shop because the proprietor got him to say yes, yes. Eddie had become interested in bow hunting and had spent considerable money in purchasing equipment and supplies from a local bow store. When his brother was visiting him he wanted to rent a bow for him from this store. The sales clerk told him they didn't rent bows, so Eddie phoned another bow store. Eddie described what happened. A very pleasant gentleman answered the phone. His response to my question for a rental was completely different from the other place. He said he was sorry but they no longer rented bows because they couldn't afford to do so. He then asked me if I had rented before. I replied, yes, several years ago. He reminded me that I probably paid $25 to $30 for the rental. I said yes again. He then asked if I was the kind of person who liked to save money. Naturally, I answered yes. He went on to explain that they had both sets with all the necessary equipment on sale for $34.95. I could buy a complete set for only $4.95 more than I could rent one. He explained that is why they had discontinued renting them. Did I think that was reasonable? My yes response led to a purchase of the set, and when I picked it up, I purchased several more items at this shop and have since become a regular customer. Socrates, the gadfly of Athens, was one of the greatest philosophers the world has ever known. He did something that only a handful of men in all history have been able to do. He sharply changed the whole course of human thought, and now, 24 centuries after his death, he is honored as one of the wisest persuaders who ever influenced this wrangling world. His method, did he tell people they were wrong? Oh, no, not Socrates. He was far too adroit for that. His whole technique, now called the Socratic method, was based upon getting a yes, yes response. He asked questions with which his opponent would have to agree. He kept on winning one admission after another until he had an armful of yeses. The next time we are tempted to tell someone he or she is wrong, let's remember old Socrates and ask a gentle question a question that will get the yes, yes response. The Chinese have a proverb pregnant with the age-old wisdom of the Orient. He who treads softly goes far. They have spent 5,000 years studying human nature, those cultured Chinese, and they have garnered a lot of perspicacity. He who treads softly goes far. Principle 5. Get the other person saying yes, yes immediately. 15. The safety valve in handling complaints. Most people trying to win others to their way of thinking do too much talking themselves. Let the other people talk themselves out. They know more about their business and problems than you do. So ask them questions. Let them tell you a few things. If you disagree with them you may be tempted to interrupt, but don't. It is dangerous. They won't pay attention to you while they still have a lot of ideas of their own crying for expression. So listen patiently and with an open mind. Be sincere about it. Encourage them to express their ideas fully. 
Does this policy pay in business? Let's see. Here is the story of a sales representative who was forced to try it. One of the largest automobile manufacturers in the United States was negotiating for a year's requirements of upholstery fabrics. Three important manufacturers had worked up fabrics in sample bodies. These had all been inspected by the executives of the motor company, and notice had been sent to each manufacturer, saying that, on a certain day, a representative from each supplier would be given an opportunity to make a final plea for the contract. GBR, a representative of one manufacturer, arrived in town with a severe attack of laryngitis. When it came my turn to meet the executives in conference Mr. R said as he related the story before one of my classes, I had lost my voice, I could hardly whisper, I was ushered into a room and found myself face to face with the textile engineer, the purchasing agent, the director of sales and the president of the company. I stood up and made a valiant effort to speak, but I couldn't do anything more than squeak. They were all seated around a table, so I wrote on a pad of paper, Gentlemen, I have lost my voice, I am speechless. I'll do the talking for you the president said, he did, he exhibited my samples and praised their good points, a lively discussion arose about the merits of my goods, and the president, since he was talking for me, took the position I would have had during the discussion, my sole participation consisted of smiles, nods and a few gestures, as a result of this unique conference, I was awarded the contract, which called for over half a million yards of upholstery fabrics, at an aggregate value of $1,600,000 the biggest order I had ever received, I know I would have lost the contract if I hadn't lost my voice, because I had the wrong idea about the whole proposition, I discovered quite by accident, how richly it sometimes pays to let the other person do the talking, one day Mrs. Wilson told one of our classes, I just gave up, Lori had disobeyed me and had left the house to visit her girlfriend, before she had completed her chores, when she returned I was about to scream at her for the 10,000th time, but I just didn't have the strength to do it, I just looked at her and said sadly, why Lori, why, Lori noted my condition, and in a calm voice asked, do you really want to know, I nodded and Lori told me, first hesitantly, and then it all flowed out, I had never listened to her, I was always telling her to do this or that, when she wanted to tell me her thoughts, feelings, ideas, I interrupted with more orders, I began to realize that she needed me not as a bossy mother, but as a confidant, an outlet for all her confusion about growing up, and all I had been doing was talking when I should have been listening, I never heard her, from that time on I let her do all the talking she wanted, she tells me what is on her mind, and our relationship has improved immeasurably, she is again a cooperative person, before he called, he spent hours in Wall Street finding out everything possible about the person who had founded the business, during the interview, he remarked, I should be mighty proud to be associated with an organization with a record like yours. I understand you started 28 years ago with nothing but desk room and one stenographer. Is that true? Almost every successful person likes to reminisce about his early struggles. This man was no exception. He talked for a long time about how he had started with $450 in cash and an original idea. He told how he had fought against discouragement and battled against ridicule, working Sundays and holidays, 12 to 16 hours a day, how he had finally won against all odds, until now the most important executives on Wall Street were coming to him for information and guidance. He was proud of such a record, he had a right to be, and he had a splendid time telling about it. Finally, he questioned Mr. Cubulus briefly about his experience then called in one of his vice presidents and said, I think this is the person we are looking for. Mr. Cubulus had taken the trouble to find out about the accomplishments of his prospective employer. He showed an interest in the other person and his problems. He encouraged the other person to do most of the talking and made a favorable impression. Roy G. Bradley of Sacramento, California, had the opposite problem, he listened as a good prospect for a sales position talked himself into a job with Bradley's firm, Roy reported, Richard Pryor had the type of experience we wanted for this position, and he was interviewed first by my assistant, 
who told him about all the negatives related to this job. He seemed slightly discouraged when he came into my office. I mentioned the one benefit of being associated with my firm, that of being an independent contractor, and therefore virtually being self-employed. As he talked about these advantages to me, he talked himself out of each negative thought he had when he came in for the interview. Several times it seemed as though he was half talking to himself as he was thinking through each thought. At times I was tempted to add to his thoughts, however, as the interview came to a close, I felt he had convinced himself, very much on his own, that he would like to work for my firm, because I had been a good listener and let Dick do most of the talking. He was able to weigh both sides fairly in his mind, and he came to the positive conclusion, which was a challenge he created for himself. We hired him, and he has been an outstanding representative for our firm. Even our friends would much rather talk to us about their achievements than listen to us boast about ours. Larachifau called, the French philosopher, said, If you want enemies, excel your friends, but if you want friends, let your friends excel you. Why is that true? Because when our friends excel us, they feel important, but when we excel them, they or at least some of them will feel inferior and envious. By far the best liked placement counselor in the Midtown Personnel Agency in New York City was Henrietta G. It hadn't always been that way. During the first few months of her association with the agency, Henrietta didn't have a single friend among her colleagues. Why? Because every day she would brag about the placements she had made, the new accounts she had opened, and anything else she had accomplished. I was good at my work and proud of it Henrietta told one of our classes, but instead of my colleagues sharing my triumphs, they seemed to resent them. I wanted to be liked by these people. I really wanted them to be my friends. After listening to some of the suggestions made in this course, I started to talk about myself less and listen more to my associates. They also had things to boast about and were more excited about telling me about their accomplishments than about listening to my boasting. Now, when we have some time to chat, I ask them to share their joys with me, and I only mention my achievements when they ask. Principle 6. Let the other person do a great deal of the talking. 16. How to get cooperation. Don't you have much more faith in ideas that you discover for yourself than in ideas that are handed to you on a silver platter? If so, isn't it bad judgment to try to ram your opinions down the throats of other people? Isn't it wiser to make suggestions and let the other person think out the conclusion? Adolf Seltz of Philadelphia, sales manager in an automobile showroom and a student in one of my courses, suddenly found himself confronted with the necessity of injecting enthusiasm into a discouraged and disorganized group of automobile salespeople. Calling a sales meeting, he urged his people to tell him exactly what they expected from him. As they talked, he wrote their ideas on the blackboard. He then said, I'll give you all these qualities you expect from me. Now I want you to tell me what I have a right to expect from you. The replies came quick and fast. Loyalty, honesty, initiative, optimism, teamwork, eight hours a day of enthusiastic work. The meeting ended with a new courage, a new inspiration. One salesperson volunteered to work 14 hours a day and Mr. Seltz reported to me that the increase of sales was phenomenal. Take the case of Eugene Wesson. He lost countless thousands of dollars in commissions before he learned this truth. Mr. Wesson sold sketches for a studio that created designs for stylists and textile manufacturers. Mr. Wesson had called on one of the leading stylists in New York once a week, every week for three years. He never refused to see me said Mr. Wesson, but he never bought. He always looked over my sketches very carefully and then said, no, Wesson, I guess we don't get any today. After 150 failures, Wesson realized he must be in a mental rut. So he resolved to devote one evening a week to the study of influencing human behavior to help him develop new ideas and generate new enthusiasm. He decided on this new approach. With half a dozen unfinished artist sketches under his arm, he rushed over to the buyer's office. I want you to do me a little favor, if you will he said. Here are some uncompleted sketches. Won't you please tell me how we could finish them up in such a way that you could use them. The buyer looked at the sketches for a while without uttering a word. Finally he said, leave these with me for a few days, Wesson, and then come back and see me. 
Wesson returned three days later, got his suggestions, took the sketches back to the studio, and had them finished according to the buyer's ideas. The result? All accepted. After that, this buyer ordered scores of other sketches from Wesson, all drawn according to the buyer's ideas. I realized why I had failed for years to sell him said Mr. Wesson. I had urged him to buy what I thought he ought to have. Then I changed my approach completely. I urged him to give me his ideas. This made him feel that he was creating the designs. And he was. I didn't have to sell him. He bought. Letting the other person feel that the idea is his or hers not only works in business and politics. It works in family life as well. Paul M. Davis of Tulsa, Oklahoma, told his class how he applied this principle. Our daughter, Anne, had just completed a course in U.S. history in junior high school and had become very interested in the events that had shaped our country's growth. I asked her how she would like to visit the places she had learned about on our next vacation. She said she would love to. This same psychology was used by an X-ray manufacturer to sell his equipment to one of the largest hospitals in Brooklyn. This hospital was building an addition and preparing to equip it with the finest X-ray department in America. Dr. L, who was in charge of the X-ray department, was overwhelmed with sales representatives, each caroling the praises of his own company's equipment. One manufacturer, however, was more skillful. He knew far more about handling human nature than the others did. He wrote a letter something like this. Our factory has recently completed a new line of X-ray equipment. The first shipment of these machines has just arrived at our office. They are not perfect. We know that, and we want to improve them. So we should be deeply obligated to you if you could find time to look them over and give us your ideas about how they can be made more serviceable to your profession. Knowing how occupied you are, I shall be glad to send my car for you at any hour you specify. I was surprised to get that letter Dr. L said, as he related the incident before the class. I was both surprised and complimented. I had never had an X-ray manufacturer seeking my advice before. It made me feel important. I was busy every night that week, but I canceled a dinner appointment in order to look over the equipment. The more I studied it, the more I discovered for myself how much I liked it. Nobody had tried to sell it to me. I felt that the idea of buying that equipment for the hospital was my own. I sold myself on its superior qualities and ordered it installed. Ralph Waldo Emerson in his essay Self-Reliance stated, In every work of genius we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. Colonel Edward M. House wielded an enormous influence in national and international affairs. While Woodrow Wilson occupied the White House, Wilson leaned upon Colonel House for secret counsel and advice, more than he did upon even members of his own cabinet. What method did the colonel use in influencing the president? Fortunately, we know, for House himself revealed it to Arthur D. Houghton Smith, and Smith quoted House in an article in the Saturday Evening Post. After I got to know the president House said, I learned the best way to convert him to an idea was to plant it in his mind casually, but so as to interest him in it so as to get him thinking about it on his own account. The first time this worked it was an accident. I had been visiting him at the White House and urged a policy on him which he appeared to disapprove. But several days later, at the dinner table, I was amazed to hear him trot out my suggestion as his own. Did House interrupt him and say, that's not your idea, that's mine, oh, no, not House, he was too adroit for that, he didn't care about credit, he wanted results, so he let Wilson continue to feel that the idea was his, House did even more than that, he gave Wilson public credit for these ideas, let's remember that everyone we come in contact with is just as human as Woodrow Wilson, so let's use Colonel House's technique. A man up in the beautiful Canadian province of New Brunswick used this technique on me and won my patronage. I was planning at the time to do some fishing and canoeing in New Brunswick, so I wrote the Tourist Bureau for information. Evidently my name and address were put on a mailing list for I was immediately overwhelmed with scores of letters and booklets and printed testimonials from camps and guides. I was bewildered. I didn't know which to choose. Then one camp owner did a clever thing. 
He sent me the names and telephone numbers of several New York people who had stayed at his camp, and he invited me to telephone them and discover for myself what he had to offer. I found to my surprise that I knew one of the men on his list. I telephoned him, found out what his experience had been, and then wired the camp the date of my arrival. The reason why rivers and seas receive the homage of a hundred mountain streams is that they keep below them, thus they are able to reign over all the mountain streams. So the sage wishing to be above men putteth himself below them, wishing to be before them, he putteth himself behind them. Thus though his place be above men, they do not feel his weight, though his place be before them, they do not count it an injury. Principle 7. Let the other person feel that the idea is his or hers. 17. A formula that will work wonders for you. Remember that other people may be totally wrong, but they don't think so, don't condemn them, any fool can do that. Try to understand them, only wise, tolerant, exceptional people even try to do that. There is a reason why the other man thinks and acts as he does, ferret out that reason and you have the key to his actions, perhaps to his personality. Try honestly to put yourself in his place. If you say to yourself, how would I feel? How would I react if I were in his shoes? You will save yourself time and irritation, for by becoming interested in the cause, we are less likely to dislike the effect. And, in addition, you will sharply increase your skill in human relationships. Stop a minute says Kenneth M. Good in his book, How to Turn People into Gold. Stop a minute to contrast your keen interest in your own affairs with your mild concern about anything else. Realize then that everybody else in the world feels exactly the same way. Then, along with Lincoln and Roosevelt, you will have grasped the only solid foundation for interpersonal relationships, namely, that success in dealing with people depends on a sympathetic grasp of the other person's viewpoint. Sam Douglas of Hempstead, New York, used to tell his wife that she spent too much time working on their lawn, pulling weeds, fertilizing, cutting the grass twice a week. When the lawn didn't look any better than it had when they moved into their home four years earlier, naturally, she was distressed by his remarks, and each time he made such remarks, the balance of the evening was ruined. After taking our course, Mr. Douglas realized how foolish he had been all those years. It never occurred to him that she enjoyed doing that work and she might really appreciate a compliment on her diligence. After that he often helped her with the gardening and complimented her on how fine the lawn looked. What a fantastic job she was doing with a yard where the soil was like concrete. Result, a happier life for both because he had learned to look at things from her point of view even if the subject was only weeds. In his book Getting Through to People, Dr. Gerald S. Nirenberg commented, Cooperativeness in conversation is achieved when you show that you consider the other person's ideas and feelings as important as your own. Starting your conversation by giving the other person the purpose or direction of your conversation, governing what you say by what you would want to hear if you were the listener, and accepting his or her viewpoint will encourage the listener to have an open mind to your ideas. Dr. Gerald S. Nirenberg, Getting Through to People, Englewood Cliffs, and J. Prentice Hall, 1963, page 31. I have always enjoyed walking and riding in a park near my home. Like the druids of ancient Gaul, I all but worship an oak tree. So I was distressed season after season to see the young trees and shrubs killed off by needless fires. These fires weren't caused by careless smokers. They were almost all caused by youngsters who went out to the park to go native and cook a frankfurter or an egg under the trees. Sometimes, these fires raged so fiercely that the fire department had to be called out to fight the conflagration. There was a sign on the edge of the park saying that anyone who started a fire was liable to fine and imprisonment, but the sign stood in an unfrequented part of the park, and few of the culprits ever saw it. A mounted policeman was supposed to look after the park, but he didn't take his duties too seriously, and the fires continued to spread season after season. On one occasion, I rushed up to a policeman and told him about a fire spreading rapidly through the park, and wanted him to notify the fire department and he nonchalantly replied that it was none of his business because it wasn't in his precinct. I was desperate, so after that when I went writing, I acted as a self-appointed committee of one to protect the public domain. 
In the beginning, I am afraid I didn't even attempt to see the other people's point of view. When I saw a fire blazing under the trees, I was so unhappy about it, so eager to do the right thing, that I did the wrong thing. I would write up to the boys, warn them that they could be jailed for starting a fire, order with a tone of authority that it be put out, and, if they refused, I would threaten to have them arrested. I was merely unloading my feelings without thinking of their point of view. Having a good time, boys. What are you going to cook for supper? I loved to build fires myself when I was a boy, and I still love to. But you know they are very dangerous here in the park. I know you boys don't mean to do any harm, but other boys aren't so careful. They come along and see that you have built a fire. So they build one and don't put it out when they go home and it spreads among the dry leaves and kills the trees. We won't have any trees here at all if we aren't more careful. You could be put in jail for building this fire. But I don't want to be bossy and interfere with your pleasure. I like to see you enjoy yourselves. But won't you please rake all the leaves away from the fire right now? And you'll be careful to cover it with dirt. A lot of dirt. Before you leave, won't you? And the next time you want to have some fun. Won't you please build your fire over the hill there in the sand pit? It can't do any harm there. Thanks so much, boys. Have a good time? What a difference that kind of talk made. It made the boys want to cooperate. No sullenness, no resentment. They hadn't been forced to obey orders. They had saved their faces. They felt better, and I felt better because I had handled the situation with consideration for their point of view. Seeing things through another person's eyes may ease tensions when personal problems become overwhelming. Elizabeth Novak of New South Wales, Australia, was six weeks late with her car payment. On a Friday she reported, I received a nasty phone call from the man who was handling my account, informing me if I did not come up with $122 by Monday morning. I could anticipate further action from the company. I had no way of raising the money over the weekend, so when I received his phone call first thing on Monday morning, I expected the worst. Instead of becoming upset I looked at the situation from his point of view. I apologized most sincerely for causing him so much inconvenience and remarked that I must be his most troublesome customer as this was not the first time I was behind in my payments. His tone of voice changed immediately, and he reassured me that I was far from being one of his really troublesome customers. He went on to tell me several examples of how rude his customers sometimes were, how they lied to him and often tried to avoid talking to him at all. I said nothing. I listened and let him pour out his troubles to me. Then, without any suggestion from me, he said it did not matter if I couldn't pay all the money immediately. Tomorrow, before asking anyone to put out a fire or buy your product or contribute to your favorite charity, why not pause and close your eyes and try to think the whole thing through from another person's point of view. Ask yourself, why should he or she want to do it? True, this will take time, but it will avoid making enemies and will get better results, and with less friction and less shoe leather. I would rather walk the sidewalk in front of a person's office for two hours before an interview, said Dean Donham of the Harvard Business School, than step into that office without a perfectly clear idea of what I was going to say and what that person from my knowledge of his or her interests and motives was likely to answer. That is so important that I am going to repeat it in italics for the sake of emphasis. I would rather walk the sidewalk in front of a person's office for two hours before an interview than step into that office without a perfectly clear idea of what I was going to say and what that person from my knowledge of his or her interests and motives was likely to answer. Principle 8. 18. What everybody wants. Wouldn't you like to have a magic phrase that would stop arguments, eliminate ill feeling, create goodwill, and make the other person listen attentively? Yes. All right. Here it is. I don't blame you one iota for feeling as you do. If I were you I would undoubtedly feel just as you do. An answer like that will soften the most cantankerous old cuss alive. And you can say that and be 100% sincere. Because if you were the other person you, of course, would feel just as he does. Take Al Capone for example. Suppose you had inherited the same body and temperament and mind that Al Capone had. Suppose you had had his environment and experiences, 
you would then be precisely what he was and where he was, for it is those things and only those things that made him what he was. The only reason, for example, that you are not a rattlesnake, is that your mother and father weren't rattlesnakes, you deserve very little credit for being what you are and remember, the people who come to you irritated, bigoted, unreasoning, deserve very little discredit for being what they are, feel sorry for the poor devils, pity them, sympathize with them, say to yourself, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Three-fourths of the people you will ever meet are hungering and thirsting for sympathy. Give it to them and they will love you. I once gave a broadcast about the author of Little Women, Louisa May Alcott. Naturally, I knew she had lived and written her immortal books in Concord, Massachusetts, but, without thinking what I was saying, I spoke of visiting her old home in Concord, New Hampshire. If I had said New Hampshire only once, it might have been forgiven, but, alas and alack, I said it twice. I was deluged with letters and telegrams, stinging messages that swirled around my defenseless head like a swarm of hornets. Many were indignant, a few insulting. One colonial dame, who had been reared in Concord, Massachusetts, and who was then living in Philadelphia, vented her scorching wrath upon me. She couldn't have been much more bitter if I had accused Miss Alcott of being a cannibal from New Guinea. As I read the letter, I said to myself, thank God. I am not married to that woman. I felt like writing and telling her that although I had made a mistake in geography, she had made a far greater mistake in common courtesy. That was to be just my opening sentence. Then I was going to roll up my sleeves and tell her what I really thought. But I didn't. I controlled myself. I realized that any hot-headed fool could do that. And that most fools would do just that. I wanted to be above fools, so I resolved to try to turn her hostility into friendliness. It would be a challenge, a sort of game I could play. I said to myself, after all, if I were she, I would probably feel just as she does. So, I determined to sympathize with her viewpoint. The next time I was in Philadelphia, I called her on the telephone. The conversation went something like this. Me, Mrs. So-and-so, you wrote me a letter a few weeks ago, and I want to thank you for it. She, in incisive, cultured, well-bred tones, to whom have I the honor of speaking? Me, I am a stranger to you. My name is Dale Carnegie. You listened to a broadcast I gave about Louisa May Alcott a few Sundays ago, and I made the unforgivable blunder of saying that she had lived in Concord, New Hampshire. It was a stupid blunder and I want to apologize for it. It was so nice of you to take the time to write me. She. I am sorry Mr. Carnegie, that I wrote as I did. I lost my temper. I must apologize. Me. No. No. You are not the one to apologize. I am. Any school child would have known better than to have said what I said. I apologized over the air the following Sunday, and I want to apologize to you personally now. She, I was born in Concord, Massachusetts. My family has been prominent in Massachusetts affairs for two centuries, and I am very proud of my native state. I was really quite distressed to hear you say that Miss Alcott had lived in New Hampshire, but I am really ashamed of that letter. Me, I assure you that you were not one-tenth as distressed as I am. My error didn't hurt Massachusetts, but it did hurt me. It is so seldom that people of your standing and culture take the time to write people who speak on the radio, and I do hope you will write me again. If you detect an error in my talks, she, you know, I really like very much the way you have accepted my criticism. You must be a very nice person. I should like to know you better. So, because I had apologized and sympathized with her point of view, she began apologizing and sympathizing with my point of view. I had the satisfaction of controlling my temper, the satisfaction of returning kindness for an insult. I got infinitely more real fun out of making her like me than I could ever have gotten out of telling her to go and take a jump in the Skylkill River. Every man who occupies the White House is faced almost daily with thorny problems in human relations. President Taft was no exception and he learned from experience the enormous chemical value of sympathy in neutralizing the acid of hard feelings. In his book Ethics and Service, Taft gives rather an amusing illustration of how he softened the ire of a disappointed and ambitious mother. 
A lady in Washington wrote Taft, whose husband had some political influence, came and labored with me for six weeks or more to appoint her son to a position. She secured the aid of senators and congressmen in formidable number and came with them to see that they spoke with emphasis. The place was one requiring technical qualification, and following the recommendation of the head of the bureau, I appointed somebody else. I then received a letter from the mother, saying that I was most ungrateful, since I declined to make her a happy woman, as I could have done by a turn of my hand. She complained further that she had labored with her state delegation and got all the votes for an administration bill, in which I was especially interested, and this was the way I have rewarded her. When you get a letter like that, the first thing you do is to think how you can be severe with a person who has committed an impropriety or even been a little impertinent. Then you may compose an answer. Then if you are wise, you will put the letter in a drawer and lock the drawer. Take it out in the course of two days. Such communications will always bear two days delay in answering. And when you take it out after that interval, you will not send it. That is just the course I took. After that, I sat down and wrote her just as polite a letter as I could, telling her I realized a mother's disappointment under such circumstances, but that really the appointment was not left to my mere personal preference, that I had to select a man with technical qualifications, and had, therefore, to follow the recommendations of the head of the bureau, but the appointment I sent in was not confirmed at once, and after an interval I received a letter which purported to come from her husband, though it was in the same handwriting as all the others. I was there and advised that, due to the nervous prostration that had followed her disappointment in this case, she had to take to her bed, and had developed a most serious case of cancer of the stomach. Would I not restore her to health by withdrawing the first name and replacing it by her son's? I had to write another letter, this one to the husband, to say that I hoped the diagnosis would prove to be inaccurate, that I sympathized with him in the sorrow he must have in the serious illness of his wife, but that it was impossible to withdraw the name sent in. The man whom I appointed was confirmed, and within two days after I received that letter, we gave a musicale at the White House. The first two people to greet Mrs. Taft and me were this husband and wife, though the wife had so recently been an articulo mortis. J. Mangum represented an elevator escalator maintenance company in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which had the maintenance contract for the escalators in one of Tulsa's leading hotels. The hotel manager did not want to shut down the escalator for more than two hours at a time, because he did not want to inconvenience the hotel's guests. The repair that had to be made would take at least eight hours, and his company did not always have a specially qualified mechanic available at the convenience of the hotel. When Mr. Mangum was able to schedule a top-flight mechanic for this job, he telephoned the hotel manager, and instead of arguing with him to give him the necessary time, he said, Rick, I know your hotel is quite busy and you would like to keep the escalator shut down time to a minimum. I understand your concern about this, and we want to do everything possible to accommodate you. However, our diagnosis of the situation shows that if we do not do a complete job now, your escalator may suffer more serious damage, and that would cause a much longer shutdown. I know you would not want to inconvenience your guests for several days. The manager had to agree that an eight-hour shutdown was more desirable than several days. By sympathizing with the manager's desire to keep his patrons happy, Mr. Mangum was able to win the hotel manager to his way of thinking easily and without rancor. Joyce Norris, a piano teacher in Street, Lewis, Missouri, told of how she had handled a problem piano teachers often have with teenage girls. Babette had exceptionally long fingernails. This is a serious handicap to anyone who wants to develop proper piano playing habits. After her first lesson, when I felt the time was right, I said, Babette, you have attractive hands and beautiful fingernails. If you want to play the piano as well as you are capable of and as well as you would like to, you would be surprised how much quicker and easier it would be for you if you would trim your nails shorter. Just think about it, okay? She made a face which was definitely negative. I also talked to her mother about this situation, again mentioning how lovely her nails were. Another negative reaction. It was obvious that Babette's beautifully manicured nails were important to her. 
The following week Babette returned for her second lesson, much to my surprise, the fingernails had been trimmed, I complimented her and praised her for making such a sacrifice, I also thanked her mother for influencing Babette to cut her nails, her reply was oh, I had nothing to do with it, Babette decided to do it on her own, and this is the first time she has ever trimmed her nails for anyone. Did Mrs. Norris threaten Babette? Did she say she would refuse to teach a student with long fingernails? No, she did not. She let Babette know that her fingernails were a thing of beauty, and it would be a sacrifice to cut them. She implied, I sympathize with you I know it won't be easy, but it will pay off in your better musical development. Sol Hurok was probably America's number one impresario. For almost half a century he handled artists such world-famous artists as Chelyapin, Isadora Duncan, and Pavlova. Mr. Hurok told me that one of the first lessons he had learned in dealing with his temperamental stars was the necessity for sympathy, sympathy and more sympathy with their idiosyncrasies. For three years he was impresario for Theodor Chelyapin, one of the greatest bassos who ever thrilled the ritzy box holders at the Metropolitan. Yet Chaliapin was a constant problem. He carried on like a spoiled child. To put it in Mr. Hurok's own inimitable phrase, he was a hell of a fellow in every way. For example, Chaliapin would call up Mr. Hurok about noun of the day he was going to sing and say, Soul, I feel terrible. My throat is like raw hamburger. It is impossible for me to sing tonight. Did Mr. Hurok argue with him? Oh, no. He knew that an entrepreneur couldn't handle artists that way. So he would rush over to Chalia Penn's hotel, dripping with sympathy. What a pity he would mourn. What a pity. My poor fellow. Of course, you cannot sing. I will cancel the engagement at once. It will only cost you a couple of thousand dollars but that is nothing in comparison to your reputation. Then Chaliapin would sigh and say, perhaps you had better come over later in the day. Come at five and see how I feel then. At five o'clock, Mr. Hurok would again rush to his hotel, dripping with sympathy. Again he would insist on cancelling the engagement, and again Chaliapin would sigh and say, well, maybe you had better come to see me later. I may be better then. At 7.30 the great basso would consent to sing, only with the understanding that Mr. Hurok would walk out on the stage of the Metropolitan and announce that Chaliapin had a very bad cold and was not in good voice. Mr. Hurok would lie and say he would do it, for he knew that was the only way to get the basso out on the stage. Dr. Arthur I. Gates said in his splendid book Educational Psychology, sympathy the human species universally craves. The child eagerly displays his injury, or even inflicts a cut or bruise, in order to reap abundant sympathy. For the same purpose adults show their bruises, relate their accidents, illness, especially details of surgical operations. Self-pity for misfortunes real or imaginary is in some measure, practically a universal practice. So, if you want to win people to your way of thinking, put in practice. Principle 9. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. 19. An appeal that everybody likes. I was reared on the edge of the Jesse James country out in Missouri, and I visited the James farm at Kearney, Missouri, where the son of Jesse James was then living. His wife told me stories of how Jesse robbed trains and held up banks and then gave money to the neighboring farmers to pay off their mortgages. Jesse James probably regarded himself as an idealist at heart, just as Dutch Schultz to gun Crowley, Al Capone and many other organized crime godfathers did generations later. The fact is that all people you meet have a high regard for themselves and like to be fine and unselfish in their own estimation. J. Pierpont Morgan observed, in one of his analytical interludes, that a person usually has two reasons for doing a thing, one that sounds good and a real one, the person himself will think of the real reason, you don't need to emphasize that, but all of us, being idealists at heart, like to think of motives that sound good, so, in order to change people, appeal to the nobler motives. Is that too idealistic to work in business? Let's see. Let's take the case of Hamilton J. Farrell of the Farrell Mitchell Company of Glen Olden, Pennsylvania. Mr. Farrell had a disgruntled tenant who threatened to move. The tenant's lease still had four months to run, nevertheless, he served notice that he was vacating immediately, regardless of lease. 
These people had lived in my house all winter the most expensive part of the year, Mr. Farrell said, as he told the story to the class, and I knew it would be difficult to rent the apartment again before fall, I could see all that rent income going over the hill, and believe me, I saw red, now, ordinarily, I would have waded into that tenant and advised him to read his lease again, I would have pointed out that if he moved, the full balance of his rent would fall due at once and that I could, and would, move to collect. However, instead of flying off the handle and making a scene, I decided to try other tactics, so I started like this, Mr. Doe I said, I have listened to your story and I still don't believe you intend to move, years in the renting business have taught me something about human nature, and I sized you up in the first place as being a man of your word, in fact, I'm so sure of it that I'm willing to take a gamble, now, here's my proposition, lay your decision on the table for a few days and think it over, if you come back to me between now and the first of the month, when your rent is due, and tell me you still intend to move, I give you my word I will accept your decision as final, I will privilege you to move and admit to myself I've been wrong in my judgment, but I still believe you're a man of your word and will live up to your contract, for after all, we are either men or monkeys and the choice usually lies with ourselves, well, when the new month came around, this gentleman came to see me and paid his rent in person, he and his wife had talked it over, he said and decided to stay, they had concluded that the only honorable thing to do was to live up to their lease, when the late Lord Northcliffe found a newspaper using a picture of him which he didn't want published, he wrote the editor a letter, but did he say, please do not publish that picture of me anymore, I don't like it, no, he appealed to a nobler motive, he appealed to the respect and love that all of us have for motherhood, he wrote, please do not publish that picture of me anymore, my mother doesn't like it. When John D. Rockefeller Jr. wished to stop newspaper photographers from snapping pictures of his children, he too appealed to the nobler motives. He didn't say, I don't want their pictures published. No, he appealed to the desire, deep in all of us, to refrain from harming children. He said, you know how it is, boys. You've got children yourselves, some of you. And you know it's not good for youngsters to get too much publicity. When Cyrus H.K. Curtis, the poor boy from Maine, was starting on his meteoric career, which was destined to make him millions as owner of the Saturday Evening Post and the Ladies' Home Journal, he couldn't afford to pay his contributors the prices that other magazines paid, he couldn't afford to hire first-class authors to write for money alone, so he appealed to their nobler motives, for example, he persuaded even Louisa May Alcott, the immortal author of Little Women, to write for him when she was at the flood tide of her fame, and he did it by offering to send a check for a hundred dollars, not to her, but to her favorite charity. Right here the skeptic may say, oh, that stuff is all right for Northcliffe and Rockefeller or a sentimental novelist, but I'd like to see you make it work with the tough babies I have to collect bills from. You may be right, nothing will work in all cases and nothing will work with all people. If you are satisfied with the results you are now getting, why change? If you are not satisfied, why not experiment? At any rate, I think you will enjoy reading this true story told by James L. Thomas, a former student of mine. Six customers of a certain automobile company refused to pay their bills for servicing. None of the customers protested the entire bill but each claimed that some one charge was wrong. In each case, the customer had signed for the work done, so the company knew it was right and said so. That was the first mistake. Here are the steps the men in the credit department took to collect these overdue bills. Do you suppose they succeeded? 1. They called on each customer and told him bluntly that they had come to collect a bill that was long past due. 2. They made it very plain that the company was absolutely and unconditionally right, therefore he, the customer, was absolutely and unconditionally wrong. 3. They intimated that they, the company, knew more about automobiles than he could ever hope to know. So what was the argument about? 4. Results, they argued. Did any of these methods reconcile the customer and settle the account? You can answer that one yourself. At this stage of affairs, the credit manager was about to open fire with a battery of legal talent. 
when fortunately the matter came to the attention of the general manager. The manager investigated these defaulting clients and discovered that they all had the reputation of paying their bills promptly. Something was wrong. Here something was drastically wrong about the method of collection. So he called in James L. Thomas and told him to collect these uncollectible accounts. Here, in his words, are the steps Mr. Thomas took. 1. My visit to each customer was likewise to collect a bill long past due a bill that we knew was absolutely right. But I didn't say a word about that. I explained I had called to find out what it was the company had done or failed to do. 2. I made it clear that until I had heard the customer's story. I had no opinion to offer. I told him the company made no claims to being infallible. 3. I told him I was interested only in his car, and that he knew more about his car than anyone else in the world, that he was the authority on the subject. 4. I let him talk, and I listened to him with all the interest and sympathy that he wanted and had expected. 5. Finally, when the customer was in a reasonable mood, I put the whole thing up to his sense of fair play. I appealed to the nobler motives. First I said, I want you to know I also feel this matter has been badly mishandled. You've been inconvenienced and annoyed and irritated by one of our representatives. That should never have happened. I'm sorry and, as a representative of the company, I apologize. As I sat here and listened to your side of the story, I could not help being impressed by your fairness and patience. And now, because you are fair-minded and patient, I am going to ask you to do something for me. It's something that you can do better than anyone else, something you know more about than anyone else. Here is your bill. I know it is safe for me to ask you to adjust it, just as you would do if you were the president of my company. I am going to leave it all up to you. Whatever you say goes. Did he adjust the bill? He certainly did and got quite a kick out of it. The bills ranged from $150 to $400 but did the customer give himself the best of it? Yes, one of them did. One of them refused to pay a penny of the disputed charge, but the other five all gave the company the best of it. And here is the cream of the whole thing. We delivered new cars to all six of these customers within the next two years. Experience has taught me says Mr. Thomas that when no information can be secured about the customer, the only sound basis on which to proceed is to assume that he or she is sincere, honest, truthful and willing, and anxious to pay the charges, once convinced they are correct. To put it differently and perhaps more clearly, people are honest and want to discharge their obligations. The exceptions to that rule are comparatively few, and I am convinced that the individuals who are inclined to chisel will in most cases react favorably, if you make them feel that you consider them honest, upright and fair.